Greetings, folks, and welcome to our second little talk on Watchmen, this one assuming you've read up to the end of Book 6. As with the previous one, what I think I'd like to do with this is focus on a particular detail or small set of details and use these as a way of perhaps opening up the narrative in ways that might otherwise not be obvious. In this case, probably unsurprisingly, I'd like to talk a bit about Dr. Manhattan, but I'm going to leave the technological sides of his character aside because I think we're going to want to address those in class. What I'd like to do instead is talk about a few details that anchor him quite firmly in Hindu thought, in Hindu philosophy, and Hindu mythology. Because, of course, Moore and Gibbon are not merely working within the parochial Western world views, are they? And this becomes more and more obvious as the narrative progresses, and I think actually ties into the first little talk on matters of perspective. In any case, let's just have a gander at what the two of them are up to. As I mentioned in the introductory lecture, Dr. Manhattan's original name, John Osterman, is important. Osterman means man of the East in German. That is, his name points him out of, or directs the reader's attention out of, the worldview, or cluster of worldviews, rather, that a Western audience can be assumed to be familiar with. And as long as we're on the topic of names, we should probably also address initials. This may sound weird, but I don't think it really is. If we take the Osterman and the Manhattan initial, O and M, we end up with the syllable OM. Now, given that Osterman means man of the East, and we're therefore we're already supposed to be looking East, Ohm tells us exactly where we're supposed to be looking for our understanding of who and what Dr. Manhattan actually is. Ohm, of course, as some of you may know, is a sacred syllable, the most sacred syllable in Hindu thought. It is the word or syllable with which I'm not going to say every Hindu scripture begins because I haven't read them all, and that is literally the largest theological literature in the world. But that said, I've never read, for example, an Upanishad that didn't begin with that word. It's a big deal. But what does it mean? And here I think we need to maybe cut through a whole lot of Western cliches and parodies and dig right into the texts that, ex that explain what that word is all about, and see if it has anything to do with Dr. Manhattan, which I think it does. So, for our purposes, I'll just, for the time being at least, stick to two Upanishads, the Mandukya and the Maitri. The Mandukya Upanishad offers a clear explanation of what Om actually is. Now, of course, it's not written in the Roman alphabet, it's written in Sanskrit, which I don't read. But the word there is actually given not in two letters, in three, that can be represented by the Roman letters A-O-M. That is, the vowel is actually a diphthong, not a pure vowel. It's two vowel sounds elided into a single syllable. That matters, because each of the sounds has a meaning. This is why it's repeated over and over again. It's not just a sound. It's a sound that carries a great deal of significance. In fact, I think it's the most distilled use of language that human beings have ever come up with. Here's what it means in the Mandukya Upanishad. The O element, as you make the sound Om, which we can represent with the letter A, stands for waking consciousness. The kind of consciousness we're all experiencing right now, where our reasoning faculties are online, our categories of thought are relatively firmly in our heads, we kind of think we know what we're doing. The second part of that vowel, or diphthong rather, U, so we glide from A to U, OM, the U stands for dreaming consciousness. You're asleep, but you're conscious. Something is happening in your mind, but your mind works very differently in a dream, doesn't it? In this sense, what's important is that our categories of thought are less concrete. We flow from one thing to another without being bound by reason, by logic, by, by chains of thought, which can really be chains. The M element stands for 
sleeping consciousness. Or if you prefer dreamless sleep, you're alive, but you're not aware of anything. Now put those all together and you have all three types of consciousness according to this particular Upanishad. That is, you have a harmony of consciousness that transcends dualities. All dualities, of course, in Hindu thought are mistakes. They are artifices or artifacts, rather, of consciousness that, while sometimes useful, can often cause more harm than good. They trap us in illusions of our own unique identity, for example. And whenever a category of thought presents itself as being real rather than merely a convenience or a product of consciousness, then it leads us necessarily, according to this body of thought, to misunderstandings of ourselves, each other, the world, and our place in it. Now, the Maitri Upanishad takes this a little further and includes the silence on either end of the word. That is, it takes everything that the Manduki Upanishad says as given and adds the silence from which the word arises and to which it again subsides. So there we have what we might call something like being and non-being, with the being being broken down into all of the ways in which being functions on a mental level. So in that sense, Om is the poetic representation, the linguistic representation of everything and nothing in a non-dualistic sense. But what does this have to do with Dr. Manhattan? To answer that question, we need to, I think, continue exploring this facet of his character. Certainly, he challenges dualities, doesn't he? He both is and is not John Osterman. He is not stably located, either in space or in time. In fact, he seems to experience time as more or less a continuous present tense, with a few interesting exceptions. He is also both multiple and singular. And not only multiple and singular, but triple and singular. That is, he is also a trinity when we see him with Lori, for example. Well, there are a couple of mythic trinities that we may want to have in mind here. One, of course, is the Christian trinity, with which most people are probably are going to be familiar. But the other is the roughly 500-year-older trinity, coming out of Hindu mythology of Brahma the creator, Vishnu the sustainer, and Shiva the destroyer, in which you have the arising and subsiding of all of the cosmos. Now, to push this a little further, and here I need to refer to another text that unfortunately you haven't read, so I'll try to sum up what I can in as concise a way as possible. A book that I'm virtually certain is present in here is, is the Bhagavad Gita, which is a relatively short excerpt from the very long epic, the Mahabharata. The main two characters in the Bhagavad Gita are Arjuna, who's kind of like a Hindu Achilles figure, and Krishna. Krishna is an avatar that is a full incarnation of the god Vishnu, and during the heart of the conversation that Krishna and Arjuna have, Krishna claims to be and shows himself to be not only Vishnu, but also Brahma and Shiva and Arjuna himself and everything in the world and time and consciousness and thought and also Om. And typically in Hindu iconography, Krishna is represented as blue as is Dr. Manhattan. Krishna is also, in the Gita, self-created, and we see Dr. Manhattan assembling himself from his various parts. So there's that moment when he creates himself, but he can also remember back to before that version of himself was created. In fact, he makes a reference to his own sort of timelessness, in frame 9 on page 13 of book 4, he says, Sometimes I feel as if I've been here all the time. While at the same time, or actually a couple of pages previously, he denies both being God and believing in any God. These two things fit oddly together, don't they? And I just want to let those two juxtaposed 
lines hang in your consciousness and see what you can make of them. I'm not going to try to wrestle with them here, but I think if you do, you might have some fun. What I am going to do here for the time being is point out one final detail of Dr. Manhattan's depiction and then probably pick up this element of the conversation in either the third or the fourth supplementary talk. But the last thing I want to point out here is that, of course, in the scene in which Dr. Manhattan inscribes the hydrogen atom on his forehead as a symbol, as he says, that he can respect rather than the completely phony looking atom, but very kind of pop culture 1950s style atom that the government lackey wants him to wear. What he's also inscribing on himself is an open eye in the third eye position. Now, in Hindu iconography, and not just Hindu iconography, but also Buddhist and Egyptian iconography, both of which also play very clear roles in the narrative, the third eye indicates spiritual awakening seeing not merely the physical but the spiritual side of the cosmos and one's own being. Now in a Hindu sense there's even more I want to say about this and that is depictions of Shiva the destroyer who is not evil by any stretch of the imagination. Shiva's destruction is a creative destruction which makes room for more creation because time of course is cyclic in this worldview. But Shiva is depicted as having a third eye, but the third eye closed. And it's when Shiva's third eye opens that the cosmos ends. Because specifically, what the opening of the third eye signifies is the seeing through of illusion or the dissolution of illusion. And of course, in much Hindu thought, and we saw this also in the Diamond Sutra, so this is also true in much Buddhist thought, the cosmos itself is illusory. Not that there isn't anything there, but the categories of thought through which we understand it are illusory. And the opening of the third eye can symbolize the seeing through or the dissolution of those categories of thought, the seeing of things nakedly as they are. And that that is a type of destruction because it's a destruction of all the mechanisms by which Those with only two eyes, I guess you can say. No. Well, Dr. Manhattan's third eye is open. And he is named after the Manhattan Project, after all. And on that note, I think I'll wrap this supplementary talk up. And as I said, probably pick up these threads, either in the next one or in the last one. I hope you find this interesting. And I'm really, really, really looking forward to talking with you again. Bye for now.